Hi, everybody. Um, I hope this works out well. We'll see how it goes. Um, all right, so uh, I was planning to show, give this lecture actually on Monday, but uh, technical difficulties and trying to get this thing to work and other things made it difficult to do. Um, so I'm giving it a try today. Um, all right, so today I'm, what I'm going to do is we, we went through some of these slides very quickly after the appropriate time uh, on um, last Friday. I'm going to go through some of those slides again and then go a little bit further. Um, that's sort of my plan. Uh, so this is basically the same lecture, uh, but expanded from Friday. Uh, for, I might start first actually for talking with the lab about the lab a little bit. So let me just switch over to the lab if this thing allows me to do that. Uh, all right, the, here's the lab. Um, so Sepita tells me that everybody was able to log in and it's got the Jupyter notebook going. Um, I the the purpose of this lab is actually a couple of things. I mean, you're first supposed to go and uh, try to get yourself familiar with Python. So um, I, I I think it's a good idea for you guys to, when you have the time, to read all the way through stuff. But I think what, another skill that should be um, uh, you should practice is trying to just pick what you need out of documentation because there's just huge amounts of documentation out there. So um, the what I was suggesting was that you read through the exercises first just to get a sense of what's going on uh, and what the kind of things I'm going to ask you to be able to do, and then look through the primers so that you can focus your attention on the things that you think are going to be useful. And this is a skill that I think is important for you to pick up as you try to basically Google around and mine the internet for uh, very specific information that you're going to need to be able to do a particular task. So we want, I wanted to exercise that. Of course, I do recommend that you sit down and go through these lectures yourselves on your own, uh, uh, you know, as, let's say, reading homework for you um, so that you get yourself familiar with Python. Um, I provided three uh, 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 links here. Um, you know, it's not really uh, that important to me which one you do. It's uh, um, it's sort of a thing on their own. I, I'm what, I, what I'm trying to tell you is that I, I expect you to be able to, to know sufficient Python to, be able to do the problems that we do and whatever you don't know to be able to go and learn. And these are some resources for you, OK? Um, all right, so then let's. Uh, if you look at the exercises themselves, they're, the way that these are structured were um, the, really the, the goal here is I'm making you do a bunch of things in like pure Python. So it's like basic data manipulations, which actually you're going to end up doing all the time in NumPy. But I want, and, but then when you do it in NumPy, you give it the data and you say, do, do this operation to it. And so it'll, like you say, calculate the mean. So it'll run a loop over the data and go calculate the mean and give it back to you, but you won't see that calculation. And I, what I wanted you to be able to understand is, uh, you know, how that calculation is done. So I just have having you do a few calculations by hand, the hard way and slow because this is going to be in Python, um, so that you get a some, uh, you know, an idea of how these things could be working. You're not going to have to understand the details of every single uh, operation that you're going to apply. Well, most of them are actually primitives, and you probably should understand pretty clearly what is happening. But maybe you won't understand the implementation, and that's irrelevant. But you should be able to imagine how it would be implemented and what is being done. And this is so that's what I'm trying to exercise here. And and so at the same time, you're getting a little bit of exposure to the syntax of Python if now you're familiar with it and all that. Okay. So um, the I, I guess the whole lab is sort of a homework, but. The, the end of this lab is is sort of the uh, the most uh, is you know the, the thing that I intended for you to do at home, and what we're doing here is actually the lab basically you generate some random data, you store it in a Python list, you calculate you know some basic things about it, um, then you sort of write a function to uh, and uses some mechanism that I described to be able to count different things like count how many numbers are above zero or above one half or less than uh, just a, a way of doing that. Uh, so you'll implement that, and then you'll you know answer some questions about that. And so with so we, the data that we generated was in the flat distribution, uh, meaning that we generated numbers between zero and one, and so any number in between there were equally probable to appear. Um, what then? What we do next is for the homework is to try to uh, write a function that would generate a different distribution. And I give you a function called the Gaussian, uh, which perhaps you should be familiar. It's a normal distribution. But I'll, we will certainly talk about it a lot um, to to you know demonstrate that you can do this. And the algorithm is a pretty standard algorithm for 
for generating uh, distributions. Um, hopefully this is clear, but I will take time on Friday to assess how much of this you guys have been able to do, both from a technical perspective and also from a comprehension, if it's at the, maybe uh, you need more understanding or details of what this data formats mean. And so, um, you know, give it your best shot for Friday. I want to see as how far you can get, talk to each other and help each other out too, and then let me see where you guys are. Uh, don't worry about the grade and whatever. Let's make this a, an honest investment uh, assessment of how you're doing. But please, I want you to also, um, you know, really give it a shot. Don't, uh, um, you know, you, go, you should struggle a little bit and try to get through it and push yourself to get as far as you can. Because Okay. All right. So let's come back to the actual um, uh, um, uh, lecture. Oh, I guess uh, I will probably also post lab number two. My understanding is most of you didn't get very far on lab number one anyway. So spend your time today doing that. And talking among yourselves and help each other out and work at home and so on. Uh, but if you do have, get through it, I'll, pre, I'll put lab number two up uh, and, and at least it started on lab number two. Up, okay, let's go back to, to this. All right, so that's a plan. So, um, right, so we're, we're going to talk about uh, Unix and NumPy and Python and all that stuff. So I went through this stuff before, but I just, you know, um, I think actually Ryan was who's the one person who probably was the least experienced maybe benefit from this. So let me just go through it again. So bear with me. I'm trying to be, this is very simple stuff, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page because not everybody's a computer science major. So just defining some basic things. The CPU, that's the processor that sits inside the computer that does the instructions, right? The RAM is a working memory, so typically the CPU is operating uh, on data that's in RAM. It's actually the instructions that is, instruct that is processing is also in RAM. Um, there's a disk, which is the, the long-term storage, right? So you typically what you do is you will load programs and data from the disk into RAM, and then you would execute on them. And um, in addition to the CPU, some machines, especially in the case of us, will have coprocessors. These are other processors which we can ship data into their local memory and have those processors operate on that data, and then we'll ship back. The operating system, um, you know, you guys are familiar with iOS and Windows and Mac OS and so on, um, and Linux. This is basically uh, all the fundamental um, um, software that enables you to interact with the hardware, with your computer, and with you with, in terms of graphic user interface. All that stuff comes uh, as the operating system. Um, the file system is the basically the, um, you know, when you file file status, you know, you're storing data on disk. The disk that stores um, bits. You want to organize things, so the file system is a way of having a table of saying file names, and that points to locations which have been mapped out on the disk, which correspond to uh, uh, where you can, you know, put data in, and you can find that data and those type of things. Um, and so, I mean, not that you should know, but uh, uh, but uh, the different types of file systems for us, but there are different types of file systems, obviously. Um, the the network, I mean, everybody knows about the internet, but the the network is. I mean, we talk about the network as a neural network. We also have, you know, we have to also have this concept of network in terms of the internet, right? And so um, the the important fact here is that, especially for you guys who are beginning, you have to realize is that um, those of you who have no experience, um, the, what we're doing and the way that we're working here is that I've set up a sort of cluster, a cluster with computers, and you guys are going to remotely connect to those computers and then work on those computers. Uh, uh, and so the processing is not happening on your machine. We have one secure way of connecting between machines. This is called SSH, a secure shell, which allows you to put an encrypted tunnel between your machine and the machine that you're talking to. And that's the only pipe that we have to be able to communicate. There is, the typical way that we do that is through a um, command line interface, a shell, with, which you'll connect from your computer to another computer. And, and you basically can type in commands which the computer will respond to. Um, but for, for now, we're going to use a, uh, something else called a Jupyter Notebook. And that Jupyter Notebook is like a web uh, service that runs. And to be able to access that service, um, since this we are only able supposed to access this machine through SSH, what we need to do is do something called tunneling, which tunnels the SSH, uh, the, the, this web service through the SSH connection that you make. And you guys all did that on 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 the 
uh, the previous to get started on the previous lab. And you'll have to do that every single time when you want to start working to make the SSH tunnel. And then you connect to a web server, which is basically connected a port on your machine to a to a port on the uh, web server uh, um, that I'm running and uh, through this SSH tunnel. Okay. So quickly, the shell and GUI. The shell is the um, is the program that runs when you are you know uh, when you connect to the machine with the SSH or when you open up a, uh, a terminal window. This is a program that takes commands and typically does file operations and then runs other, uh, uh, you can use it to start other programs. Uh, a GUI is a, uh, your operating system GUI is effectively doing the same thing. It just does it with a graphical interface instead of taking you know, commands line by line. And a concept that's important to understand is environment variables. Basically, your system has a table uh, of um, you know, a name and values, which it uses to be able to uh, understand uh, you know, communicate to programs different information. And typically, what, that, what you communicate in Unix is the locations of libraries and, 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 the, and programs. So you set a, in this table, uh, you know, some things, for example, an environment variable called path, which is a list of directories that you should look for whenever you're looking for programs. Or something we call LD library path, which is similar except for libraries, so on. Um, uh, so this is something that typically we, before using our programs, we need to start. Uh, we will do uh, some setup, which will set environment variables correctly for whatever program we want to use. Okay. Um, there is, um, I mean, another important uh, uh, thing then is the you know the programs themselves. These typically will say they're an executable binary. This is a file that if I what you'd say is, is in the, to the shell go and it'll you know uh, or run this thing and it'll copy that thing from disk into memory and start in the first instruction and start going. Uh, and this is an executable is essentially a, the, the modern version, which is an application. An application is more these days. Uh, you know, you think about a GUI and those type of things, but that's effectively an executable is an application. And finally, there's a program languages, which are the languages in which we write these programs in. And there's two types. There are the type of programming languages that are uh, compiled. So you write some instructions in, in text. Uh, you compile those into uh, machine language instructions. And then you may have your text of uh, code may have referred to other functions that were co otherwise compiled, so other information that's stored in libraries. And the linker, what it'll do is it'll link your machine, you know, your compiled code to other compiled codes so that when you execute them, they will, you know, everything would work. Uh, and but in, in contrast, there's interpreter languages where there you have either a prompt or it's going through a file. What's effectively happening is that it is, it is reading the file as it's going and um, depending on what the file is telling it to do, it is performing operations, which is a, a, a different way of doing it. Uh, computer. Um, Unix, um, so you are probably familiar with Unix if you have Mac OS, if you ran Linux before. Windows is a little bit different. Um, it's, uh, so when typically the way you're going to see Unix, uh, if you don't have other, ex other experiences, that you, you can connect to my machine through this mechanism that I told you called SSH. So the machine that I will use for this, you know, the, the, the gateway to our, uh, to my cluster is a machine called Orduin. And so Orduin uta.edu, and you can SSH to it. So if you get a prompt uh, uh, in Unix, you can say SSH minus YX tells you basically to port forward the graphics and uh, also uh, um, you know, pass graphics information through SSH also, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and then name the, file, uh, the, the, the machine, and this will make a connection between your machine and my machine. And in that connection, it will run a shell uh, and that shell is basically a, a program that I described where you type in commands and things will happen, right? Shell is just a, um, you know, it, it's a way for you mostly to uh, manipulate files and directories and start other programs. So you should be familiar with commands that you can type, uh, things like CDs, change directory, L so you, you know, you understand that, um, you know, within a file system, you have a directory structure uh, where, you know, you have folders or directories where you store uh, files in so you can organize yourself. So CD is change directory, so you can go between directories. LS is list, CP is copy, MV is move, RM is, is the way you delete things, MKDIR is how you make new directories. And so there's a bunch of 
there are a lot of the Unix commands. It's not necessary immediately for you to know this, but eventually you're going to need to know this stuff. Uh, and these uh, so just to the, these commands, um, some of these are actually captured by the shell. So the shell, when you say CD, it, it just understands. Oh, you're changing where you want to you know look in the file system. Other ones are programs like LS and CPU actually are programs. Which when you say LS, what the shell does is it looks. To, uh, uh, it 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 see tries to see if it knows what ls is. It doesn't because it's not a built-in program. Then it looks in the list of directories you put in your path environment variable to see if there's a is a file called ls in there. And if there is, it tries to run that file. And if there isn't anything called ls, it'll stop. And that's how the how the uh, running uh, programs run uh, works. You just say the name of the program and enter, and it'll run it. And it'll search in your current directory and this list of directories that uh, that are specified in path to look for the um, you know the that name before running it. So things actually like ls, cp, mv, rm, they're all uh, um, are actually programs that do things like create files and move files and those things. Um, you can. For any of these commands, and in Unix in general, if you want to know how to use a command, usually you can just say man to get the manual pages. So you can say on the prompt man ls, it'll give you uh, the manual page for ls, so how to use it and how, what it works. Okay. We talked about environment variables. Environment variables here, for example, I, I'm setting the path. So this is the the, the, the list of di uh, directories that I want to um, to uh, um, go through when when I say you know, something. Uh, it'll say, uh, so this export command is how I set them. So I say, set the path to be, here's this directory that I want to look at. And then I put a colon and I say dollar path. So I already have a path. So dollar path will expand to the list of things already there. And what I'm doing is I'm putting something else in front of it and then sending it back to path. Okay. So this is how you extend your path. Now, uh, usually you're going to have to do these things like this before you get started. We'll give you instructions on how to do it, but a lot of times you can just you can write these instructions. You may be several of these environment variables you have to set. You can write it into a file, and then you can source it. So a lot of times we'll provide you a setups.sh file, which would be a file that you source, and it'll just set these environment variables for you instead of you having to type it. Okay. Now a lot of the stuff will sidestep because of Jupyter notebooks, but I just want you to know and start looking around. This is how things get set up, and if you start installing things in your own machine and so on, you should have some basic understanding. Um, Python, um, it's a interpreted language, so your code is not compiled uh, to machine. It, it's executed on the fly via calls to that compiled uh, code. So what's happened is that people wrote primitives that do different things in Python uh, that, that you want to do in Python, and uh, you know, like plus and add and uh, you know um, loops and those type of things. Um, those are written in C and are compiled. And what happens is that Python will read a file. It actually compiles it to some sort of a more compact format, not really compiling, but sort of parses it to different format. But, but effectively, it's reading the file, and it says, oh, it says, take 1 plus 1. I know what 1 is. Where's the plus function? All right, I'm going to call the, here's 1, 1. Here's another one. I'm going to call the plus function on it and gives you the result. That, and, so, and then it does the next set of instructions and so on. So it's actually interpreting the file as it's going and calling compiled C functions or, uh, as it, or whatever functions. Okay? Uh, the result of this is that it's slower. It actually has to inter every time it's doing something, it's actually interpreting something and then calling something. So it's a little bit slower. Um, and it, it, it also allows you to do things uh, where, um, you know, if I have a, the plus function, it doesn't really have to uh, know. Uh, you know, I can use it in a generic way that I can say one plus one, it'll give me two, but I can say, uh, you know, quote A plus quote B, it'll give me A, B. I guess you can do that in C++ also, but uh, the point here is that uh, there's no strict casting. I don't have to say if X is equal to one or X equals to A. I don't have to say integer X is equal to one. Um, X could be any of any type, and functions will take it and operate on it, and it will may fail if you have the wrong type. Uh, why it's interpreting, but um, there's no strict casting. Now, what we use Python for is, besides doing computation in the program language, Python ends up being, despite being slow, a good way of pulling other programming, other pieces of code together. So you can imagine you have different libraries or different tools or packages that do different type of things. Uh, and what Python allows you to do is, since most of those libraries provide some sort of Python API, what I can do is I can start a Python session, 
load those libraries in memory, and I have a Python API, and I can call functions in that library. And so what I can do is load multiple things in, uh, uh, in memory, different libraries, and you know have some data and have the first library operate on the first one and the next library operate on the second one and so on. I can, and I can do that all in Python. So it's a way of gluing all those different pieces of, uh, of code and those packages, all those libraries together, and be able to use them together. And that's, that's what Python is, it allows us to do. It's a sort of glue language because they all provide you this, um, uh, this uh, API, this, uh, this interface that you, uh, within Python. And the point here is that the, the heavy lifting of the computations will be happening in the C code in the, in the libraries, but Python is just allowing you to say, do this and then do that and pick the results of this and stick it in, in that and do this other stuff. Uh, and this actually uh, is something that we sometimes would call pipelining, where, where you know, I'm taking a data, I'm doing a bunch of operations on it, and basically it's a pipeline of do operation one, then operation two, then operation three. So Python allows me to set up that piping. Okay, even though the piping itself is actually the things that operations are happening, not in Python. Okay, so this allows you to get away, uh, uh, you know, uh, sidestep the uh, the um, the slowness of Python because none of the actual computations happen in Python, but at the same time gives you flexibility because you can, you know, write a file and immediately start interpreting it uh, and um, you know to configure what it actually is done. Okay. Uh, now, if you don't know Python. The, the lab points you to a few primers, and I just described, I want you to go through those and to get yourself familiar, but also, you know, learn as much as you need to be able to do what we need to do, okay? Uh, you can run Python. If you're running Mac OS, you can just open Terminal, type in Python, and you'll get Python. You can start working in there if you want to play around. Um, and Windows, you have to install Python, but in Linux, is usually there. Um, so, the, so anyway, the, the lab that you have right now in front of you is to familiarize you with that. Let me tell you a little bit about the tools. So I was telling you these pipelining tools. So um, our fundamental data representation is going to be a tensor. And the representation that we're going to use comes from NumPy. And in fact, the thing that we're going to use to operate on those tensors is also NumPy. It's a library for doing operations on essentially tensors are effectively n-dimensional arrays. Okay? Uh, it has an interface that basically has been adopted by everyone. Um, so um, Everybody sort of inherits this uh, uh, this uh, this um, um, interface. So, for example, HDF5 and TensorFlow and Theonu and these other the tools that we have, they use the same interface, and this allows you to use NumPy functions because Num uh, Python is not a um, a strict casting uh, language. What you can do is, if I have something, two things have the same interface, and I have a function that uh, can work on this one first thing, it usually can work on the second thing also because it has the same interface. Um, I mean, that's also true, uh, you know, with C, but not C or C++. But anyway, we use that uh, fact that everybody adopts the, the NumPy interface to their, for their representations of uh, of tensors, so that we and so we will end up using different representations of tensors, sometimes not even realizing because they all have the same interface. Okay? Um, so what NumPy allows you to do is that if you're going to do something like uh, this operation, like A times B plus C, where you're trying to do tensors, uh, it it allows it does that computation. You say A is this sort of data, and B is this sort of data, and C is this sort of data, and you say A times B plus C, which if tensors, this is let's say if they're matrices, these are you know um, loops that you have to do to be able to compute the elements of these matrices. It just has all those loops in there, and it'll just does it for you. And when you Say that command and press enter, it'll do it right then and there and give you the result D. Fianu is something that works, uh, that uses the same sort of tensor notation uh, or interface, but it does something else. It does it first symbolically. So when you say, you say A is a Fianu tensor, B is a Fianu tensor, C is a Fianu tensor, and you say A times B plus C, what you get back is an expression. It's not, it doesn't contain any data, it's just the uh, the relationship between these tensors and written down, the mathematical relationship expressed in something called an expression. And then what the, uh, Theon allows you to do is compile that expression into a piece of code, into a function effectively, right? That given the inputs will give you the results of that expression. And what it will do is actually it will it'll create a graph of that expression and call the directory the cyclic graph. It will optimize that graph and then generate code to gener to, uh, to, to, um, do the computation of what that, that, that expression does. It will then compile that code. And then, so when you say to 
uh, uh, to Theano here's an expression and compile it, it'll give you back your function that very quickly can calculate whatever was in that expression for you. And so then you get this function back f and you can apply it a times, you know, a, so you say f of a, b, c, and it will do the, uh, the computation of a times b plus c and give you back d. And the reason for this is that here, uh, the, basically this speeds things up. This is a way of, uh, because what it'll do is it'll actually uh, completely leave Python. You write the expression what you want and it just compiles it and does it completely on, you know, on a CPU or a GPU and hides that the difference also from you and um, allows you to do very quick com uh, computations. And then Keras is something that fits on top of that. And he, Keras basically what happens is Theano was developed by deep learning experts or in the context of developing all of these uh, deep learning. Uh, uh, and what it is is like it's a computational tool and it ends up that when you're doing machine learning and deep learning, really um, it's a lot of, uh, you, there's mathematical expressions that you have to compute. And so it's all about those two computations. So Theano was developed to be able to compute those things very quickly. That's what the training you need for your training. Uh, and so, um, but you need to then write the expressions that you want. And, you know, the, uh, and so those expressions could be a little bit difficult to, uh, to write down as they get complicated. And Keras basically is a way for you to be able to say, hey, I want a neural network with this kind of layer, then this kind of layer, then this kind of layer. And it will write the expression for you in Theano. So that's the tool that we uh, we will use. Okay, so that's what I was telling you about the. Well, I should. I guess that is the deep learning software. Okay, so then let's look at about data and talk about the basics. So as I said, data is stored in tensors. These are basically n-dimensional arrays with some shape. Okay, so a, a tensor of shape MT is a scalar, just a single number with one dimension is a vector, two dimensions a matrix, and n dimensions is a tensor. Um, I'm having just a second. Let me pause here. Sorry guys, I'm in a hotel room and uh, my uh, the uh, housekeeper was wanted to come in. Okay. All right, so um, that's right. So a um, if the shape is uh, you know n different numbers, you know r different numbers is a tank uh, is a tensor of rank r. So typically, in what uh, uh, we do is we'll have some input data. This could be images or this could be you know data like let's say we're thinking about students and we want to have uh, data about each student. Um, and we'll store that in, in, in a tensor. So typically we'll call our input data X and, and this could be arbitrary shape, but typically if it's we're computing data, what the data is is N examples of something. So for example, N different pictures or N different data for students. Um, so, uh, you know, student one, student two. So the first index typically goes through the, the students. So student one should be, you know, uh, you know, index one is the first student, index two is the second student and so on, right? And then the secondary index, if it's like, say, it's student information, will be things like the actual index for information. So, for example, here I'm building a tensor. The first one, first, uh, you know, row, the first student, second row, second student, third student. And then the columns correspond to, for example, the age, if they're male or female, or what year they are, if they're undergraduate, graduate, and what their major is, for example. Okay. And I've encoded some of the information of, uh, you know, uh, as sort of uh, indices. So, for example, um, you know, there's an index corresponding to what major you're in. Actually, this is correct. Wrong. This should be, for example, three. Oops. Sorry. I should correct that. Okay. Just to give you an idea of the data, right? So, if I say x of zero, I'll get a data. This is first student's data. And if I say x zero three or zero comma three, I'll get um, um, the wrong thing, actually. I need to correct this, but I would get the you know zero and then the third element it would be that. Okay, um, so that's that's the how we store data. Our outputs will also store as uh, as something. So an output, for example, could be you're gonna uh, let's say we're doing a task where I'm gonna take students and I want to be able to predict if they know Python or not, and I'm gonna do that somehow by uh, by looking at their age, how old they are, and these other information, and I'm gonna train a, a new network to do that. My data is gonna be you know, the, the information and the answer I'm looking for is whether I know the Python or not. I've gone and done a survey and I've gotten some training data. And so I've, I, so then basically, you know, I, I'll take that information X and then the Y is the answer if they know Python or not. It's just a, a vector of zeros and one corresponding to the first one is did student one is, did, it, did, did they know Python or not? Student two is the second element, student three and so on. Okay. That's what our data will look like. Now, for machine learning, basically what we do is, um, I, I just want to quickly say is that 
the idea is that I want to be able to map the inputs to the outputs, and I'm going to train them, train, train them, uh, a, uh, a the computer to do that. That's what the idea is for machine learning. And so there are different ways of th uh, things that you can do. First of all, there are different types of inputs, and there's two that I'm going to like, sort of class of inputs that I want to uh, make very clear. There is in input like raw data, which is, for example, if you take a picture, the pixels of the of, of the picture, and there's also inputs like features. So I may have actually taken that raw data and done some things on it. So maybe I I you know um, you know measured the uh, you know what the average color is, or maybe I tried to see if I can find circles in it or something like that. And that additional information is higher level information. Typically, we call that a feature. Okay. So the, um, so if I, anything that I do to raw data and get out. So, Typically, we'll call that a feature, um, and so um, when we're, so the data that we use will typically be raw data, but sometimes we'll put in features also that we create by hand. So just to make that distinction, okay? And now there's a different types of learning. They're learning the, the kind of task where you the data you have some training set and you uh, which basically says here's the input and I know what the output should be. So I have some set of examples or something that either I simulated or I did some um, you know figured out somehow the answer to some data and I have there. And then you can do things like classification, which means that, uh, you know, I'm, I've, you know, I want to set, uh, differentiate between different classes of, uh, of, of, uh, of things within the input set. So maybe you're distinguishing, you know, pictures of people and you want to classify between men and women. And so that's a classification task. Other tasks are like regression tasks, which is, well, no, what I want to do is I want to um, um, actually not say, it's A or B, I want to actually get a number out. So for example, you have pictures of people and you want to, maybe you want an algorithm to be able to guess their age. And so that's regression. Though so you can set, sometimes set up a regression as a classification also. Um, now you can do unsurprised learning. There you don't know the answer. And typically this is sort of a clustering type of thing where you say, okay, I don't, here's a bunch of data that I have. And it's an algorithm that would automatically say, well, these things sort of together are the same and these things are together are sort of the same. So, because you don't, you haven't been able to do that yourself. Okay, there's things called semi-supervised. These are techniques, for example, where you teach these things to, uh, you give some data in, and you teach a network to reproduce itself of the same data as output. And what you're doing is that you're doing that with very few neurons. So you're sort of uh, trying to get this thing to learn, um, you know, how to represent the input data in a very compact way. And in fact, a lot of times what you're doing is you're getting this thing to learn features, which you can you know, look for in the data and to be able to then reproduce that data. That's what semi-supervised, but that's an example of it. So that's a, what I described to you is something typically called an autoencoder. And there's something called reinforcement learning where you teach, um, um, where you provide feedback to the network, either the network is interacting with some system and then so it up, does an operation and then gets read back from it and, and trains and uh, changes its weights or whatever uh, according to that feedback. Or you, you know, or you're giving feedback to it somehow instead of a system. It's you giving feedback to the network. Okay, so there's a sort of the, but this is what we're doing. This is a, we're doing a lot. Of, most of the things we're doing, we're training systems to take some input, go to some output, and these are type of uh, training, uh, you know, uh, tasks that we would do. Okay, so then let's formulate that. Okay, so imagine I have a data set, uh, which is my training data set. So that's the x, the inputs and outputs. Uh, and I'll take that data set and I'll and I'll separate it into a some set that I'm going to use for training. So some so I'm going to use 90% of the data set that I have for training, and I'm going to use let's say 10% of that data set to test. After I train, I want to see how well I, I did. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it the x's and then see what it says for y, and then compare to what I know what the answer is to see if it did a, a good job or not. And I don't want to use that in training because I don't want it to have memorized that particular that data set, okay? And this is sort of a fair assessment of what it could have learned during training. And then I might then want to apply it to some data, which I don't have the answers for, and it's a whole point for me to be able to um, to, to build this um, this neural network or whatever I'm building. Um, so let's say I have X, my, some sort of unlabeled data, data that I wanted to apply it to so that the, my system will generate labels for them. And our goals are typically things like inference, which I, uh, you know, well, our goal is inference, so given some X uh, and some set of parameters that uh, the you know some fun I want to figure out some function that given X uh, it will give you uh, predict what the output Y should be. Now F could be a heuristic. It could be that you know um, if the person has long hair then it's uh, female otherwise male. It's not going to do a good job. That's not always true, but that's a heuristic. 
uh, or something like if it's a computer science student, then the student knows Python. That's also not 100% true, right? So that's a, that function f could be something like that, but f could be anything, right? Um, now, um, if, if in a uh, neural network, f is just a neural network, but that neural network has some parameters, which are the connections between the way, uh, the neurons in that, uh, in that network, and those parameters we can collectively, for example, call a. So that's the parameters of a function, but it doesn't have to be a neural network. It could be any other technique. You, well, you could be just fitting the data into a line, and these are parameters of the line, of the intercept and the slope, for example. Um, and so uh, that uh, so the neural network is not just the structure of the network, what neurons are there, but the, the weights of connections between them, and that A represents that. So in a simple classification problem, you know, why train could be either, for example, 0, 1, uh, and why predict uh, so, you know, when I'm training, I know what the answer is. What I predict typically then will be something between 0 and 1. And so when the thing is, the neural network is really, really confident that it's either 0 or 1, it'll be very close to 0 and 1. And when it's not confident, we'll give you an answer like 1 half. Okay. So typically when you're doing some sort of, uh, after you train the thing, you, know, you, you won't, you'll, you know, you'll, the output that you'll get wouldn't be discrete. And what you'll have to do is say, look, if it thinks, you know, if it's, it's better than 0.7, it's above 0.7, I'm going to say it's class 1 and the less than 0.3, I'll say is class zero, and otherwise it's ambiguous. That's up to you to decide, okay? So training for neural networks is really usually an optimization task. And basically the way you train neural networks is that I have got my training sample, and so I will have some function, I will call it on the training sample, I'll get the answer, I will compare that answer to what the answer should be, and what I will try to do is change the parameters of that function such that these things, the, the difference between the answer it gives and the real answer becomes small. Now that difference between the real answer and the, uh, and the answer that it gives is something we call a cost function. So I'm going to pay it at C. So this is some function. So this is, this is my training sample. Um, this is the function. It's got some parameters. This will, when I call that, it will give me my prediction of that. My cost function will compare that prediction with what the answer should be and give me some difference. So it could be literally the square, the difference, so for example, between uh, the two results, the, the, really the numerical difference of the two vectors that I get out. Um, and what I want to do then is to take that cost function and minimize that cost function with respect to these, uh, with the, these parameters of this function uh, that I have, this neural network function f. So if I minimize that, then when this thing, if it works out, then I, uh, you know, this function will then do a good job and the output will be very close to what I expect the output to be. And then whenever, after that minimization, I will have a set of parameters, A, and that I've gotten the, that, you know, are an optimal set of parameters. I'll call those my train parameters, like A train, and as a result of my training. And then I'll go do some validation. <clears throat> and what I'll do for that validation is that I'll take that function, take it and run it on a test sample, given that train, uh, train set of weights, see what the output is, and then compare that to what the output should be, and I can use a cost function again to be able to do that to say how well I did. That's one way of, for example, validating that it, uh, that this thing still works, or it did the right job, and it didn't just learn how to get the answer on this the training set, but it learned, but in general, in general, can answer the, the thing. And okay, uh, and then there's other metrics. You can create the other metrics. So for example, I can sort of say why a test is equal to uh, you know I can like for example look in the testing sample, get the subset of things that are class one, run it through, and say how, see how often you know the output of the net of this uh, neural network is above one half. So then that'll tell, and I'll say that's, I'm gonna consider if it's above one half, for example, that belongs to class one. And so what I'll get is that, oh, well, 90% of the time that I give it a class one thing, it correctly see, identifies as a class one. And I'll do that then with class zero and, you know, 10% or 5% of the time when I give it a class zero thing, it mistakenly thinks that it's class one. So I can do those kind of games as a metric, okay? Um, and then my inference is just this step where I don't take the data that I don't know and we'll give the train sample, apply my neural network to it, and uh, give the trained uh, network and get the prediction. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, so um, the reason I bring this up is because these are the type of computations we're going to be doing and fundamentally this is the, and so I want you to understand why you're, le you know, learning NumPy and all this stuff is because you're going to effectively be writing these expressions, okay, and that's what neural network training and application actually are. So artificial neural networks. So basically, um, the the implementation of artificial neural network is very simple. If you imagine that I have a bunch of uh, inputs, so my uh, let's say my my input vector is x, 
right? So the, the, the rows correspond to examples and the columns correspond to uh, whatever parameters I, that, I, uh, that I have for each example, um, then um, I can write a neural network as just a matrix operation of x times w uh, and then plus some bias uh, b, where w is my weight matrix, which is one of the things that I'm going to try to optimize, right? And b is some bias matrix. So uh, my parameters that I'm going to, you know, that I'm optimizing are the w's and b's, the whatever is in there. And so if this matrix, let's say that, that I have n examples, my matrix will be n by m. Uh, and so what will happen is I'm going to do the multiplication. If I, I will get a uh, m output. So there was n inputs, that was the size of x, and there's m outputs. And that's the output. And basically that represents, um, you know, n inputs coming in and getting connected to m, uh, m neurons. Okay. Uh, so that's it. That's that's where our, uh, uh, the the basic neural network. Now the neural network. Uh, the the other component of this is that it has to be nonlinear in response. So what happens is that I have this input that comes in. Uh, that input is connected to this neuron through some weight, and then so it sees that input, and that neuron is only going to give an output if that input is or the sum of those inputs that it gets uh, are above a certain threshold. And that that threshold is sort of called a uh, you know, uh, you know that, that that mechanism or that function that you use is called an activation function. So, for example, if it gets so the, if the inputs are very very small, uh, negative, uh, it'll have a you know minus. Uh, well, you typically wouldn't do minus, but anyway. But um, so the idea is that it'll look like this. So it'll give no outputs uh, for very li little input, and once it goes beyond a threshold, it quickly starts giving a big output. So if you give something below zero, for example, to this network, it'll give you um, wouldn't give you much of an output, and when you go above zero, it'll give you a big output. For example, and that's what the, that basically is what's mimicking uh, in a crude way what, how neurons work in our in our brain, and so that's one layer of a neural network. And basically, if you want to build multiple layer neural network, you do this once, and then you take the output of that and put and do it again into another one, into another one, into another one. You just stack these on top of each other, and effectively, what you're doing is you're getting a bunch of weights, bunch of inputs at each layer coming in, uh, getting sort of uh, sums up with respect to rates in, uh, f uh, for, uh, f into each neuron, and then you get some output uh, um, out of that neuron, and you have many, many neurons. That's effectively what this equation says. We're going to do this much more carefully, actually, on next week. Okay. And the okay. All right. Uh, and then so then the optimization task is to take this function, uh, that th this cost function, and to and minimize it. And that, what that means is that. So this cost function, which is the difference between what the neural network is predicting and when I know what the answer should be, I want it to be minimum, is a function of some parameters I'm calling alpha here. Uh, and um, I need to minimize this function with respect to alpha. And then we do it as something called gradient descent. And this is something you should have sort of, it's Newton's method is what you, sh you should have learned it in calculus. Basically what you can do is, it's the same thing uh, as if you are, for example, in a topological map or you know, standing on a mountain and you want to get to the top of the mountain or the bottom. If you want to get to the top of a mountain, what you do is you calculate, there's a function that represents your altitude with respect to x and y position uh, on, the, on the map. And you, you take the gradient, which is a derivative in, in each of the directions. And whichever direction that derivative points is a direction of maximal change. So if you go in that direction, you go, you'll go to the, the, the peak of the, uh, of the mountain you're standing on. And if you in the, go in the direction, the opposite direction, you'll go to the valley. And so that's basically what gradient descent is, is that you, you stand somewhere, you calculate the derivative, take a step in the derivative, and then you calculate again the derivative at that other step, and you take steps along the derivative at every single point, and following it down all the way to the valley or to the peak. And so what we want to do is this, 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 this function, this, this uh, map now is actually the cost function, and this is not just two dimensions, but whatever dimensionality this has, you basically, you're at some point in this space, you calculate a derivative, uh, you know, of the cost function um, with respect to that. You you, you move in, in in the direction that would maximally minimize that or reduce the, the value of that cost function, following that down all the way into the minimum of that cost function if you can. There's no unique minimum actually for for neural networks, but there's all lots of but this still works amazingly. Okay, so that's it. So uh, so this is actually numerically. This is this is what I'm, so this is for example an example of of walking down some other topological sort of uh, topographical sort of scenario and um, you do this by um, 
uh, iterative process. So I have some, so I'm starting sending somewhere. So I have my parameters alpha, which is my coordinates right now in this map. So my X and Y or whatever parameters are the, of the network. And so to figure out the next set, I'll calculate the derivative. So this is the cost function with respect to this should be alpha I actually. Uh, I calculate the gradient that gives me the vector to go in that direction I want to go. I'll take a, st a step of size epsilon uh, in the opposite direction because I want to minimize uh, of that, and that gives me the next set of parameters. That's what that does. Okay. Um, so I think I've gone probably long enough, so I'm going to stop uh, so you guys have a little time to work. Uh, I will get on, on, on this stuff to, uh, the next time. Um, all right. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I So if there's any time left in this class, uh, I would encourage you to continue with the lab um, from last time, and I will make an assessment on Friday where you guys are. Thank you very much.